Locked On Rays, your daily Tampa Bay Rays podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Rays podcast. And today, Ulysses, we have the pleasure of being joined by Jason Burke, who is the host of the Locked On A's podcast. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. I am uh, going to do this is for people that are listening. Uh, our second time recording this portion of the podcast, just the intro. And so I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm so happy to be talking to my good friend Ulysses and also Kyle Tucker, who is here right now. Uh, it, this is truly an honor, Kyle. Thank you so much. Of course, absolutely. I know I sometimes or uh, in some ways look like Kyle Tucker, although some have said I'm better looking than Kyle Tucker. So Most definitely, works. yeah. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate Agreed. it. Not as athletically gifted or talented or rich as Kyle Tucker, unfortunately. So there's a trade-off. But you got him on looks. There you go. That's one yeah. category, baby. I can trick the ladies and say, yes, I'm Kyle Tucker. <laughs> I'm not quite as tall as Kyle Tucker. He's about 6'4". I'm about 6'2". But there you go. put some lifts in my shoes like Tom Cruise, and I'm good to go. Roll around Tampa. I, I tell people I'm, I'm 6'4 all the time. I'm probably 6'2", so it's fine. Yeah, okay. it, Roll with it. You're 6'4 now, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Everybody lies about their height. Everybody yeah. lies on their resume. Everybody lies about their height. If you're six foot, you're five ten, Alex Bregman. I'm sorry. How tall is then Jose Altuve then? Uh, four eleven. He is, is he four eleven? Yeah, that's what he's. Yeah, four eleven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My uh, you know eight year old niece is uh, taller taller than Jose Altuve. Yeah. There we go. Height jokes. We're off to a, a, a roll here. Yeah. Um, Jason, yes. Mark Kotze, that is yeah. the new manager of the Oakland A's. He is. Your thoughts on the hire? I don't know. I'm, I'm one, their A's fandom is split into two camps right now. And I think that I fall in the, I don't know. And I'm going to throw it back to you guys here in a sec, but my, my basic thoughts are, I don't know much about his managerial tactics. And I know that he is one of the A's guys. And from as an internal hire, I like him a lot. He's he also he had a big moment for the A's in the playoffs in 2006 with the inside the park home run in the ALDS. That was fantastic. Uh, thoroughly enjoy that. I have no ill ill thoughts about Mark Kotze in general. I really like him as a person, but I guess that I'm wondering whether or not they would have been better served to take maybe, I don't know, the Rays bench coach or the Astros bench coach and get some different blood in there, some different thought processes. Uh, the players seem to be happy with the Mark Kotze hire, which is great. You want a guy that your your players are happy with, but at the same time, is he going to be challenging the way that they think or approach the game? I'm not sure. So that's where I am going to be intrigued to learn more about him. I'm not mad at the hire, but I think that they could have gone a different route and maybe potentially gotten better results. And it's going to be an interesting time for the A's, you know, with, with the moves that are probably coming this offseason. How are they going to be attacking all of that stuff? So, uh, and can he develop talent? Uh, I don't know how good it, he is at any of this stuff, whether or not he can manage just a regular baseball team, whether or not they're rebuilding or not. So there's a lot on the table and a lot of questions that I'm going to have. I'm going to be watching him very closely this coming season. But uh, my, my question for you guys is Kevin Cash was, he, he was also a brand new manager when he came to the Rays. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what were the expectations for him? What were you guys looking out for? What did you, what did, what did you hear about him before he actually got the job? And uh, you know, obviously he's been doing okay. So it's not like somebody with no experience can't do well. The, the other two guys that I mentioned also have no experience, but um, you know, what, what was your thought process when Kevin Cash was hired, I guess, is my main question here. Honestly, uh, I remember exactly where I was. I was in a hostel in Barcelona, and, <laughs> and, I, and I read that Kevin Cash had been hired. Disappointment. Honestly, uh, you know, if, if I'm being completely honest with you, disappointment, because there were so many other names. I think Eduardo Perez was in the running, Barry Larkin, you know, names with a little bit more of baseball stature, maybe mm -hmm. baseball elite. And so you were like, man, really? You're going with Kevin, the guy that I remember always as a backup catcher for so many other teams, including the Devil Rays. So it was a disappointment at first, but the the work that he has done, that he has shown to to be able to do with 
the 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 payroll, the 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 injuries, the division that they they're, they're in. I mean, Kevin Cash has basically just flipped that on its head. At least, on my opinion, of being disappointed to being wow, uh, very lucky to to have a, a guy that um, that can handle a room like 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 he does. Did, was it the same for you, Kevin? Yeah, for the most part. The only thing I really knew about Kevin Cash leading into it was yeah, he wasn't a good hitting catcher. Uh, back in his days and he was a local kid he was originally from Lutz he went to Gaither High School he went to Florida State University so he had that local tie if you will uh, and I know there's a lot bigger names out there or there were at the time Barry Larkin Eduardo Perez but then again you look at just because you have a big name just because you had a great career does not mean you're going to be a good manager right. or a coach and in fact a lot of times it's the opposite guys that you know learned and, and really had to grind and struggle their way to make it to the big leagues and have staying power are, are the guys that can best connect with players. Barry Bonds didn't work out as a hitting coach. Why? Maybe some of it was the fact that the game came extremely easy to right. him. Like, hey, just hit the ball. No, I, I, I'm not as good as you, Barry Bonds. You got to help me out. You got to give me some tips and techniques. Whereas Chad Matola gets rave reviews. Yeah. So... Um, well, and so I, I will say I am also very happy that it wasn't like a Buck Walter type or anything. So have fun mm -hmm. with him, Mets. Um, I, I'm happy that it wasn't like an old guard person. I, I wanted somebody with a little bit more youthful vigor. Uh, I, I am totally fine that he doesn't have the experience. I'm just intrigued to see if it, the internal candidate works out or an external candidate might have been a better hire. That's all that I'm debating between right now. But when, when you talk about internal hire, you know, him being in, in this organization, mm -hmm. not only as a player, but late, you know, since basically six, seven seasons now, yeah. uh, was it like a runaway? I mean, was it just like for – were you just waiting for the social media tweet uh, from like two months ago? Or was it still like, oh, wow, they went with Kotze? Uh, no, it, it seemed like it, once Bob Melvin went, it, there was speculation. I was like – I mean, the internal guy that you would go with is Katze, in my opinion. And there, there, there was other guys in the running, but uh, if they had given it to, I don't know, the A's hitting coach, there probably would have been uh, so, some harsher words on A's Twitter. Um, but I, I felt like he was the guy. He'd been wearing a bunch of different hats the last few seasons. He's been trained to do all of this stuff. It, you know, he's been working his way up to be the manager. And so that... It didn't really catch us by surprise necessarily. It was more so, are they going to go internal with Kotze, basically, or external? And then it became more clear that it was going to be an internal guy and therefore Kotze uh, the last week or so. So that, that's how it went down. It was a good time. Jason, is this your roundabout, long-winded way of saying that you'd prefer that Bob Melvin had stayed with the Athletics? No. I mean, oh. I, I like Bob Melvin a lot. And uh, I, I'm happy for him, I think is what it is, uh, that the Padres are a super exciting team and go manage the crap out of that team, Bob Melvin. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't want him to have to go through another rebuild. He doesn't deserve that. He deserves to be, you know, I, I like Bob Melvin a lot. So I'm happy for him if he finds success or if he's happy somewhere else. That's great. Good job, Bob Melvin. Um, but what, the A's will see what they got to do. It's going to be a new challenge because they're probably going to be making some big trades, which I'm sure we'll talk about here at some point. And uh, it, that could very much change who they should hire. And so it, Bob Melvin, he'd been there a while. Maybe his words weren't hitting the, the right way, but the players still seem to love him. But, uh, you know, it's always nice to get some new blood every now and then. But the A's don't change managers very often. Um, so, you know, Connie Mack was there for 50 years, and then they've had a few guys since. And that is, I mean, there was like the 70s where they changed all the time. But uh, since then, it's been like La Russa, And then, you know, you got your Bob Garens and uh, your Ken Makas and then Bob Melvin and now Mark Kotze. So, I mean, there's been a few others, but they're, they're like still. the Steelers of <laughs> yeah. uh, baseball, essentially. I think we've had 16 managers is what the, the tweet said earlier today. 16 managers in like the history of the A's. And that's that is insane. wild. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 crazy talk. Uh, the Rays might have already like they're on their way to ten uh, already. Uh, you, you mentioned it, so I, I won't feel too guilty. But you mentioned rebuilding. Mm -hmm. You mentioned trades. Um, obviously, the the Rays and the A's uh, have had you know good trades in the past, but there was one that was 
uh, maybe three weeks before the lockout ended, the, the Honeywell get for, for yeah. the A's. How do you see Brent Honeywell fitting in for the A's in 2022? Is he going to be a guy in the bullpen? Is he going to be stretched out for a starter position? Because the other T word is trade. So mm-hmm. because we might see a starter from the, the A's being traded, is that where Brent Honeywell comes in? I think that he said that he wanted to start or he would prefer to start, and I'm okay with that. Obviously, he's been dealing with some injuries of late, so uh, y- you kind of want to get what you can out of him. Um, so that is one concern. Also, the A's have, what, six years of control of him? So uh, they can slow play it if they want to, and he was a top prospect in 2018. So uh, I'm very excited to see what he has if he's healthy. And that's a big if, obviously, but if he's healthy... I'm expecting not like a, a huge breakout season, but, you know, a pretty decent season, you know, maybe league average, maybe a little bit worse, but, you know, a nice building season to start building a career on. And then you can trade them in a few years. Um, but it, I guess where they're going to where the A's would like to put him kind of depends on some of the moves that they end up making. Um, they, they have lots of holes in the bullpen right now and lots of guys that are out of options. So maybe they trade some of those other guys because Brent Honeywell has the pedigree. He he can do it, I, I would imagine, if he can stay healthy. And uh, I, I think that he was brought in because they definitely have a spot for him on the big league roster, unless he just gets completely rocked in spring training. I don't see them even cutting him then. They're going to give him some sort of a shakeout in, in the major leagues. So we'll see what happens there. But it's there, there's going to be trades. And it just, are they going to be trading three-fifths of their rotation? Are they going to be trading one-fifth? It depends. And so we'll, we'll see what happens, I guess, is yeah. what goes there. But I I think that I would probably slot him into the rotation and maybe a long man kind of relief role. But, you know, one of those two. He, he's going to be getting probably 80, 90, maybe 100 innings. I don't think they're going to try and push him too, too hard. That's not a bad return for cash considerations. No, no, it, no. it really isn't for, for maybe even a four or five starter. Uh, now, you talked about 60% of the rotation might go, maybe mm-hmm. maybe only one guy in that rotation. Where are you in that spectrum of the 2021-2022 uh, offseason as an A's guy? Do you see it as, okay, uh, Olsen, Manaya, Bassett, Montes, Chapman – are they all gone? Is only one of them gone? Like, what do you expect this offseason to kind of be for the for, for, for Oakland and A's fans? I think that my expectation would be that Olsen is gone because okay. he had a fantastic season in 2021 and his value is probably never going to be higher. I don't know that he can re- necessarily exceed what he did. He might be able to repeat it, but... I, I feel like we saw peak Matt Olson and he's got two years of control left. So the longer you hold on to him, the less control that the team that would be acquiring him would have. So this would be the time that you're going to trade him if you're going to trade him. And you're going to get a pretty solid return for Matthew Kent Olson. And so if you're going to be start rebuilding and you're not going to resign him anyway, trade him now. Screw it. And then if you're trading Matt Olson, why not trade everybody else? Um, and so... If you're going to be trading Olsen, the other guy that I would expect to see moved is Frankie Montas because he has the highest ceiling. He also stayed healthy for the first time or didn't get suspended for the first time. He played a full season. Let's say that uh, in 2021. And he was pretty he was pretty darn good. He was really, really good. He had a few blow up starts uh, in the beginning and the first half of the season. But the second half of the season, he was amazing. He was just lights out. Uh, He gets lots of swings and misses on that splitter. And I think that they could get a nice solid return for him as well. And then from there, I'd probably start depleting that rotation because the other two guys that you got in there are Chris Bassett, who's a he's a workhorse. He's amazing. I love watching Chris Bassett pitch. Uh, this, they say that his stats aren't great. He, he's been fine. He's been really good, comparable to Garrett Cole, who I'm sure you guys are tired of facing. Uh, <laughs> but he's been a really, really good pitcher, and he's going to go out there and give you innings at the very least um, and give give up like three runs. He's going to give you a quality start basically every time he goes out there. And uh, it, he's a great teammate. So I think that he would be a solid addition. He might not have as big of a prospect return, but I think that the value to the team that he would be going to would also be high. And then you got Shamanaya who had a really, really crappy month of August. 
But uh, and that really tanked his stats. He had like a 392 ERA at the end of the season, but he also had like a nine ERA in August. But other than that one month, he was really, really good. So I could see him being a valuable trade piece as well. So that could be three fifths of the rotation right there. And we haven't even talked about Matt Chapman leaving, uh, you know, as well. Um, Chapman could go either way. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd, I'd say that those would be the four guys. Well, you know, uh, you got Olsen and Montas. Those, those would be the top two guys that I would see. If they start trading guys, those are the first two. And then probably after that, Bassett and Manaya, And then maybe Matt Chapman, just because Matt Chapman's had a couple of down years in a row at the plate. And you kind of want to sell on the upswing, as you guys are aware of. And uh, I, I don't know that he's on the upswing just yet. But if they're getting fair offers for Matt Chapman or what they think that they can get for Matt Chapman, even if he has a little bit of a bounce back, then I think that he could also be on the move. It's just a matter of what kind of trades are they fielding for Matt Chapman. Uh, he's, he struck out a whole bunch last year. He was also coming off a hip surgery during the offseason. So uh, is his hip going to be better? I assume that it is. And so I would expect him to have a very, very nice 2022 season. So you don't want to sell him too early if he's going to be nice and healthy and out there producing. So uh, those would be the main guys to watch out for. There's also Ramon Laureano who's going to be suspended, so I don't really think he's going to go, but he's also right. a very va valuable trade uh, piece, according to the Trade Values website. And then there's Sean Murphy in a, in a catching market that doesn't have a lot of options right now. He could also be a huge, another nice piece that could bring back a nice, a really good return for the A's. So uh, he also has four years of control left. So uh, yeah, anybody could be in play for Sean Murphy. So they could Get rid of everybody. We could have. We might know like five guys on the team for next year. <laughs> As of right now, there's not a lot. <laughs> it's like that. Uh, I don't know if you were uh, a fan of Arrested Development, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that show? Man, we are not clicking on the TV shows or the movies. Nothing. No. It's a fire sale. It's a fire sale. <laughs> you know. It's... You got. I got Do nothing you want me to emphasize the fire. I'm sorry, <laughs> Jason. You're with me though, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Give me an office oh, reference. Man. Help me out here. Sing, Grace. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna leave the room now. You guys can finish up. Locked it's on a banana, Michael. How much could it cost? <laughs> yeah. Uh, two questions related to this, Jason. First off, which of those players or another player would upset you most to see traded? Like, man, Ooh. really? Why did they have to get rid of this guy? Like, I, I could make you a can mention a lot of names. Of, like, the, there's so many yeah. possibilities, but you know, which guy is is really like, man? Really, I, I could make a case for a bunch of them. I, Matt Olson just has such a nice swing. I love watching that, and uh, I I really like Matt Olson. He just he's always mm -hmm. smiling. He has such nice hair. He's a good looking guy. So you <laughs> like having one of those on the baseball team. <laughs> and then uh, Shamanaya is just such a delight to watch. Uh, I love him as a person. He looks. Just like he's having fun and he's goofing around, he's doing stuff with his hair. He's he's just a fun guy. And Chris Bassett has worked his butt off, his butt off for this franchise, and uh, I I just appreciate the hell out of him. And uh, he doesn't ha you know throw the hardest, but he gets the results, and I I admire that about him too. And I'm leaving out Matt Chapman not on purpose, just because I don't know that he's going to be traded. So I, I went with the other three guys first. And Frankie Montas seems like a nice guy too. I, I like him. He, he's always on Instagram posting pictures of him with the family, and I think that's adorable. God, Jason. <laughs> so all of them. You're, yeah. So so you're just <laughs> ready for your heart to be just crashed into pieces in the next couple months. I mean, I've done this a few times now, so I'm like, eh, you know, it, you, you get ready for it like a year ahead of time. I've got a nice protective coating over my heart at this point. Like, yeah, all right, cool. That sucks. Uh, yeah. Hopefully they get traded to a team that I can wa like like watching them on. Like if one of them goes, like if Ramon Laureano got traded to the Padres, I'm like, hey, that's cool. He gets to be with Bob Melvin. They love each other. That'd be great. But uh, yeah, be, be on a fun and exciting team. Don't trade them to the Astros, please. That's all that I'm asking, really. Is just a, just don't trade them to a team where I'm like, eh, they suck now. I don't like them. Um, even the Dodgers. I, I'm not a big Dodgers fan anymore. They, they've they've peaked out for me, I think, at this point. I liked them for a minute, and now I'm like, eh, they're fine. Yeah, um, yeah there, there's... I mean, I don't want Matt Olson to go to the Yankees, but they do uh, They do have some prospects that I'm very interested in. Mm -hmm. So, And that that's the other side of the coin for me is, obviously, they might rip my heart out, but at the same time, 
uh, there, there's going to be some returns that I'm going to be very excited about because I love getting very hyped about prospects for no reason whatsoever. I'm like, ooh, they have a 60 hit tool. This guy's going to be amazing. And then I dream on that until they get to the big leagues. And then the process starts all over again. It's a good time. <laughs> yeah, it's funny Ace because... <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Fangraphs actually just did a review of the athletic system, their farm system, and said, quote, yeah. it's not very good. So it's I not. think some trades are coming. But yeah. um, question related to an expected fire sale mm -hmm. with the athletics. So they won 86 games last year. Mm -hmm. uh, they went 36 and 24 in the 2020 season. So why the rebuild now? Why are they why are they doing it now? Guys are getting too expensive. It's mostly mm -hmm. it. Our owner, like your owner, does not like to spend the money. Uh, Matt Olson's going to make twelve million dollars next year, or projected to make twelve million dollars. Mana is at like ten. Um, all these guys that were making league minimum are now going to cost a little bit of money. Um, and when you say that to basically any franchise besides yours, they're like. $10 million. Yeah. Why can't you just pay them $10 million? That's ridiculous. Right. I'm like, no, no. You know how many people we pay like double digit million dollars? Not that many, like maybe one or two a season. That's it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a good time. Um, yeah. Honestly, that's right now. That's, that's Kevin Kiermaier territory. He's the highest paid <laughs> player right now at $12 million. And we're like, well, we got to get rid of that contract. I mean, <laughs> how are we going to pay Wander Francos if we don't, if we don't trade Kevin Kiermaier? And think like Matt Olson, he's also do. very good looking. Yes. Yes. Well, and think of all the money or all the good things you could do with that extra $12 million oh with the, the front we offices that these two franchises have. Oh, man. You know how many relievers that can get you? So Ooh. many. <laughs> I, I have faith. I'm holding out hope that that saved money is being used towards a new stadium. Mm. Not two new stadiums, but one new stadium. <laughs> that Just would be the nice. one. We only need the one. Just like it, you guys. I, I, it, I, I, in I, Montreal? I read I read that there was a very big, big uh, environmental impact report. And there was. IAR that was just released mm -hmm. on the ballpark at Howard Terminal. Uh, that means city council can vote on it early mm -hmm. next year, January, February. But is this the biggest step forward as an ace fan in getting this stadium built? Or is there still a mood and gloom, you know, surrounding it because of the Vegas uh, news that came out uh, uh, about a month ago. Can you can you give us the lowdown on where an ace fan is on the stadium issue for for, for race fans? Yes, um, there is lots of fun. Uh, it depends on who you talk to. If there's doom and gloom, or if everything's moving and looks good. Um, for me, everything looks nice. There's there's noise. There's lots of noise. But uh, and some of the local media loves to be like, oh. Why would they build here in Oakland? That's stupid. Uh, they, they never write nice things about the A's. But um, for basically, everything's moving nice. Uh, they, they're getting the votes, the positive votes that they need. Uh, this just got released. We're hopefully going to get some more positive votes from the city council and Howard Terminal itself and the A's and all that stuff. And then there's hopefully going to be a binding vote at some point in 2022, which is we're going to build this damn thing. So that's that's what we're hoping for in 2022 that's hopefully the end game for next year and uh we'll see what happens with that but with the vegas news basically whenever there's good news with the howard terminal project and the city of oakland and they they want to you know pray something something gets leaked to the las vegas <laughs> reporter and they're like oh hey yeah look we put in this bid in vegas uh it's always like same day next day that weekend it's it's a little too convenient to keep happening. And it definitely happened again this time. They were like, hey, the EIR is coming out. What is it like? I think it was the next day. And I said it on the podcast that night. So that the morning that it came up, I was like, be on the lookout for some Vegas news. There's going to be something. And then like three hours later, something happened. I, I forget what the news was because it didn't matter. It does not matter. As long as they keep moving forward. And it seemed like the A's president... Uh, not of baseball operations, but the president of the team, uh, Dave Cavill, who is a villain, 
Um, he seemed to change his tone a little bit regarding the Howard Terminal project a little bit when the EIR came out. He's like, hey, this is a great step. This is a huge step forward for us and the city of Oakland. And uh, hopefully we can get that vote soon. And he always says, hopefully we can get that vote soon because, <laughs> hey, they want to start building. Uh, so I, I think that everything's moving as it should. There has been a lot of progress made, especially in the last six months. I'm optimistic and I've been optimistic the whole time. Uh, that said, and I'm sure that you guys can relate and tell there are shovels in the ground. I do not believe it. So yes. I'm waiting for that. They can have the, the binding vote and I'd be like, yeah, I don't know. I don't see any shovels. So I'm waiting for that. So I, I believe that we are three years apart in, in our alternate realities, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the TROP a, a has the lease ending in after the 2027 season. You guys have it in 2024. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay. So it's the end of 2021 and there aren't shovels, you know, being moved up or down the earth. Better get those shovels ready. So, yeah. so when would be a, 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 a worst case scenario come 2022 where you're like, okay, we're not we're not getting this is it is it summer is it is it winter fall i mean how i'm because it take it's going to take a long time to to get that built so when when would you look at the calendar and say okay something's not right well i i believe the chronicle the uh, san francisco chronicle said that it would take about two years for the ballpark and the surrounding stuff not the entire project but the stuff that they needed to open the ballpark to mm -hmm. be ready it would be about two years Okay. So we're looking at around that time frame, and you have to think that if they're building in Oakland, they can get a year-to-year -year lease to, and get them the, the time that they need. I don't know that the ballpark would be ready for the 2025 season. Maybe it would if everything just moves fantastically and there are no interruptions, uh, but you're probably looking 2026 is my guess. So they're going to need at least a one-year re-up is my assumption, um, but... Th those are bridges that I will cross at another day. Right now, I'm just kind of happy about the EIR and all that stuff. <laughs> of course. Uh, tied into this, so what is your confidence level that the A's will remain in Oakland? If you had to divvy up percentages of the likelihood of the A's staying in Oakland versus relocating to Vegas, how would you, is it 50-50? Is it 60-40? Is it 40-60? How would you, what would you put that marker on as of today? I'm going to be optimistic. My number is going to be high, okay. but I will give you some of the reasoning. One, they they are fairly far along in the process, whereas in Vegas, they are still looking for the land that they want to actually, they haven't actually purchased land. One of the leaked stories said that they put in a, uh, an offer on some land in Vegas. And, I'm, and that day on the podcast, this is, I think, the, the stuff that you were talking about from a month ago. I was like, yes. But was it a good offer? Did they offer them like the actual value of the land or was it like, here's three dollars. We made an offer. Look at us. We're not telling a lie, but we can make the news now. Uh, so they're very, very far back on the Vegas project, I think. And I, th you got to think that from an A's ownership perspective, at least for me, to have a transplant team brought into Vegas doesn't make a lot of sense. I think that for a baseball franchise to thrive in Vegas, it has to be an expansion team because there's a lot of transplants that move to Vegas and they already have their affiliations from their hometowns. Why would they you know, stop rooting for the Phillies or the Yankees or the Mets or the Rays and move over to the A's just because they play there? They already have those affiliations. They'll, they'll go to those games when that t when their team comes but they're not going to feel any deep rooted you know fandom for the A's I don't think uh, it, it, it takes a be... long time Jason yeah. it takes uh, almost 23 years and you still have Yankee fans that have never stepped in New mm -hmm. York and have always lived in Tampa and mm -hmm. they say let's go Yankees it is wild so I I don't see it happening uh, I mean it doesn't make business sense to me and if you're going to try and sell out 81 home games, that is wild. You have to have your own fans. You can't be relying on out-of-towners or waiting for the Phillies or the Yankees to show up. I don't know why I keep 
choosing the Phillies. I feel like they travel well. I don't know. <laughs> but you, you got to have your own fans that can help you fill up that ballpark, especially if it's not, you know, in the best location. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense. Whereas in Oakland, you have that established fan base and the people that you've been alienating for years will hopefully come back to go see this brand new ballpark also on the water, just like the one across the bay. And it, it'd be the new ballpark. Maybe you get some of those Fairweather fans that became Giants fans because they're like, hey, this place is just better to be at. Maybe the A's can beat them in the experience game, which is kind of what you're going for at this point. And uh, the A's have better colors. That's all I'm saying. So um, <laughs> I, I think that I'd go 80-20 is where I'm leaning right now. I'm leaning very heavy. I think it gets done. I'm leaving some wiggle room. Oh, I love this, Kevin. I love this optimism. It gives it gives me optimism yeah. as a Rays fan to know that yeah. two years before the lease ends, you can still have this 80-20. I love yeah. it. There we go. <laughs> Sinking the optimism a little bit. Uh, Jason, which stadium do you consider to be a bigger dump? Tropicana Ooh. Field? Or I don't think it's called Oakland Coliseum anymore. What is it? Uh, yeah, Ring Coliseum. Central Coliseum. Where do the athletics play? Whatever. Oh, yeah. No, Which... just the Coliseum. It changes year to year. It does not matter. Nobody calls it that. It's just the Coliseum. Wow. <laughs> right. Well, at least we, we can take solace with Tropicana Field. It's always it's Tropicana Field. Yeah, That's not Tropicana. changing. Yeah, so, right. uh, what, it, what, it was never what... Enron either. So you got that going for you. <laughs> man, oh, man. How about that? So yeah, which is uh, which is the bigger dump in your opinion, or or do you like both of them? I mean, that's a possibility yeah, that's too. Possibility. But we get a lot of uh, On, yeah, both are. Crap Honestly, I, I have never been to the trop, so I okay. would feel uh, disingenuous in judging the trop based off of all of the rankings lists that you see. Um, but if it's anything like the Coliseum, which it might not be, I don't know. You guys can tell me. Uh, but I grew up going to the Coliseum. I love the Coliseum. Um, is it crappy? Yes. Is it a little bit crowded sometimes? Yeah. I like it when there's nobody there. It's fantastic. It makes me love going to baseball games when you can walk freely and yes. uh, go, go, go get a hot dog whenever you want to. They're like, yes. yeah, the attendance numbers. I'm like, screw that. No, I want to go get a hot dog whenever yeah. I want to. And I yes. will say, just quick shout out to Dodger Stadium, which is not part of the question. But uh, we, we sat on the first level and you could get a beer in between innings and be back at your seat for the next pitch. It was amazing how just efficient they were there because they wow. had beer stands like every five feet. It was amazing. Um, so hopefully that is something that they do for the new A's ballpark. Um, but yeah, I, I like the Coliseum. So um, do you guys like the Trop? Because it's fine if you do. I know that, you know, the Coliseum has flaws, but... I'm okay with that. I'm there to watch a baseball game. I don't need the glitz and the glam. It's fun, but I don't need it. I just want to watch the baseball game. You, you know what? It, it, it's kind of – we both dig it. And, and, and I think it's, it's very difficult and disingenuous for somebody to say that it's a, it's a dump if they've never lived in Florida mm -hmm. because you, you can't just submit yourself to four hours of being in a ballpark without AC. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you'd have children dying. Like that's, that's yeah. not how you grow the game is by having eight year olds, <laughs> you know, struggle with, with, with humidity. So yeah. you need the AC. So you need something close. Are the catwalks an eyesore? Sure. But you know what? When Nelson Kruitz hits a banger uh, on, on the D ring against the Red Sox, against Red Sox fans around you, that makes for a, a good time. Yeah. Right, Kevin. I mean, we, we like the drop. I agree. And in some ways, it creates a really big home field advantage for yeah. the race oh. because other hate teams playing in Tampa are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a big deal. Care for the location or the parking situation, but I do love that air conditioning in August. And I agree with you, Jason. Look, I, I enjoy going to Rays Orioles games where there's 5,000. <laughs> in the stands because I can just roll in, roll out, move freely. Yeah. Sit where I want, not have to deal yeah. with people. Yeah. I love it. It's, it's beautiful. It's a great experience. Uh, okay, <laughs> should we uh, should we move on to some lockout talk? Ooh, it's our sure. favorite, obviously. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the lockout, the CBA. Um, Jason, give me a or give us a guesstimate on when you think a new deal will be agreed upon. Will it be mid January? Will it be? mid-February? Will it be the 1st of March? What What's kind of your timeline for when this thing will be resolved? I did a crossover episode with 
uh, the host of Locked on Rangers, Reds, and Pirates, and I guess that it would be January 7th. I don't know why. I'm feeling much less optimistic about that date right now. That was, like, before the lockout started, um, or the day that it started. Either way, um, I just don't see it happening before spring training, unless it's, like, a couple of days before spring training. So I'm going to go middle of February. Let's say... Valentine's Day. Let's say it's Valentine's Day. That's that's when the lockout gets lifted because, uh, as you know, baseball is terrible at PR. They do not know how to time things when people are actually going to be paying attention. So, Valentine's Day it is. Okay. Uh, you know what? Uh, it's got the same vibe as we, we talked to Aram mm -hmm. uh, late in, uh, yesterday, uh, and he was mentioned the same thing, man. He's like, uh, as as close to them losing a game, that's when they'll they'll sign the papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's still probably. so much work that has to be done too. With like all of the free agents, and there's not a huge amount, but there's there's some big names out there, and yeah. they haven't been talking to these these guys. The A's, you know, in their in their fire sale, can be conversing with other GMs and getting those lined up, but they ha still have to wait for those and then get everybody on board and figure out what other holes they need uh, to, you know, fill in all that stuff. So there, there's going to need to be a few weeks before spring training, you would think, but maybe they just shorten spring training and say, screw it. I don't know. And when you talk about what we could see next year with the CBA and, and, and the, and the new things that, that could come about, what's your number one, Takeaway: You're you're wanting grievance that needs to be fixed in this CBA. Uh, they're not easy choices. I'm going to give you, but okay. I do want you to to just draw the line in the sand here. Uh, number right. one, minimum wage to be raised. Mm -hmm. Number two, reduce team control years. Number three, universal DH. Or number four, pace of game. Which one of those four? Do you have to just address if you are the guy that can address these things? I mean, I, I want the players to get paid more, honestly. Uh, that That's what I would like. I'll, I'll go with that. I, I'm very pro-player. Um, I don't really care what happens if, with the DH. I'm like, yeah, if they bring it in, cool. I, it doesn't affect you know our teams really right. that much. Um, and it's going to happen probably anyway. So uh, I didn't want to want to waste my pick on that um, pace of play. I don't care. I'm watching the baseball game no matter what. So uh, it right. doesn't matter to me. So it was really between one and two. And uh, I, I chose go players. Uh, but I do have a question uh, very similar to that for you guys. And that is uh, th these are two things that could very much not jeopardize, but affect the way that our teams operate. One of those is the, the talk about a potential salary floor where that could be nice for our teams where you got to spend a hundred million dollars a year or something like that. And then the other one is team control, which you also mentioned. Um, is there one of those that you would like to see more than the other? I assume salary floor, but um, yeah. Well, like what, is there something that you're scared of with operations as it pertains to the, to the Tampa Bay Rays? Oh, I want to hear your answer on this, Kev. Honestly, I'm not really concerned about either because I think the Rays would still find a way to adjust and evolve <laughs> and make it work one way or the other. If it's uh, less team control, mm -hmm. then they would just trade players earlier. <laughs> if it's salary floor, then maybe the Rays will have a new owner. Maybe Stu Sternberg's like, nope, not doing this. I'm selling the team. So I look at it from an optimistic viewpoint. Right. Uh, I don't think the salary floor is going to happen. I think the no. team control thing, if – it does get reduced. I think at the end of the day, it would really only be one year. So instead of yeah. six years of control, five years of control. And the, the, Rays play, uh, the Rays get rid of players, you know, before that a lot of times anyway. So, yeah, yeah that's interesting. Uh, you know, I feel like the salary floor, uh, I would love to see it as a fan, uh, mm -hmm. just to know that your team has to at least spend blank. I mean, we, we come from a, an organization that spent around $30 million and got to the playoffs in 2011. It was a miraculous game 162 and Longa had to play a uh, hero, uh, you know, like a, like a baseball movie, but 
you know, it was done. But you don't want that to be the case. You don't want your owner to just be spending $30 million because then maybe you shouldn't be owning a baseball team if you can't spend the, the right amount of money. Now, so that I, w- I would love it. And, and like Kevin said, I really wouldn't be uh, too scared of any, you know, big new nuances uh, because I, mm-hmm. I do think that they, they really like to, you know, have smart guys in that front office. I, I, I don't smell – it doesn't smell like nepotism. Or it doesn't smell like there's, you know – I think that people that are in the race front office, they are all mm-hmm. really, um, you know, adept and skilled at their job. So I mm-hmm. think they just look for, for really smart people. So I wouldn't, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, hesitate like, oh, man, are they going to be okay if they, if they do this? But if I play your game, Jason, which I am going to, um, <laughs> I think the Durham shuffle, which is what we call the, the, the Lewis head move, which is – Moving a guy with options 12, 13 times between AAA and mm-hmm. the major league roster. I feel like that is a loophole and it, good for the race to be taking care of it. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't uh, – it needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed. That's not fair to Lewis Heads and, and yeah. other guys that are going to go through that. So that one would make yeah. me kind of like, okay, maybe the depth is not going to be playing – a big part of the race success, which is a big part of the race success, is their <laughs> yeah. depth. So you would be kind of, you know, cutting, undercutting them, but um, you kind of have to block that that loophole, Kevin, right? I would think so. And it really, not only from the fact and the standpoint of it being tough on a player physically, mentally, and emotionally and, and transitioning from both levels, but the guy gets paid significantly less going to the minor league. So not only are you having to ship them out of town all the time, but it's like, now I got to take a pay cut too. Uh huh. That's another challenge. So uh, I think that's absolutely a, something that has to be addressed going forward. So well, uh, um, Jason, like, does he on- live in the same place when he goes back to AAA all the time? Or does he not, like give up that lease each time? Does he have to look for a new place every time? How does that work for that? Yeah. I, I actually don't know. Do you guys have any insight or is it just kind of like, eh? You know what? I I don't. I, I I'm guessing. Actually, I don't know. I'm sure that the team contracts with some sort of apartment complex, and they they have a deal worked out. Something tells me that they don't just leave Lewis head on the street and like, oh yeah, find your own <laughs> considerations. I think that maybe sure. he and his significant other found a place. Yeah. Or, you know, that was probably the situation there. And, and in the sense. in the case of Lewis Head, you know, he, he is an older guy, so maybe he already had a place. But, you know, for some of the younger ones that are yeah. rooming with somebody, you know, that might get a little bit more more yeah. more difficult. For the sure. lower levels, I feel like that definitely could be more of a challenge as opposed to yeah. AAA, where yeah. I'm sure there's more of an establishment there. Um, Jason, do you want to see expanded playoffs? Sort of. Um, <laughs> um, that's a very non-committal answer. I, I gave this answer, or I explored this idea on my show a couple weeks back, and I want to see what you guys thought of it. It would be a way to expand the playoffs, but also not at the very same time. And that is, what if baseball had an NIT-style tournament? where basically you have the same number of teams still make the playoffs and are still going for the World Series. But then you get four other teams based solely on record, regardless of divisions or uh, leagues. Whoever has the most wins, those four teams make it. And the first team gets to pick, the the number one seed, the the team with the most wins gets to pick who they want to face. And then the other two teams play each other. And you can do best of three you could do just one game playoffs and just put those on off days during the postseason however you want to do it to make the most money for baseball does not matter and then the team that wins both games or you know that both series however you want to do that uh they get the number one pick in the next draft that is my thought and then the other three teams are two three four and that is my thought process uh to fix uh tanking to fix a lot of different things and uh, I was wondering what you guys think of that. So um, do I want to see expanded playoffs? Sure. I, I don't care. I don't want it to be too diluted. So I don't want like 10 teams, but one or two. I Whatever. I like seeing new teams in there. I don't need to see the Astros and the championship series 
every year. Um, so yeah, give me give me some more Marlins. Give me some more other teams. Give me uh, an Orioles run. I don't care. Have them have a magical season. What if the Tigers are good next year? Let's see the Tigers in the playoffs. But what do you guys think about the NIT idea? Because uh, I only said that out loud to my audience, and I don't know what people think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I guess with, with, with two people uh, as co-hosts, you know, we, we get to get a, a sound feedback mm -hmm. pretty quickly on, on our wacky ideas. I, I dig it, man. Look, I, I, there was a, 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 an article on The Athletic by, by Jason Stark that he mentioned if the playoff, if, if he could change the draft in order to save tanking, that would be it. The, the teams that almost made it yeah. would get the number one pick, and that's the way it goes. I love that. And if you're even putting a tournament on top of that that just defines that, I think that would be great for those four markets for those four regions that maybe they got close but they can still fight for something i love that idea and you it engages the fan bases the players might like it they might yeah. not i don't know uh the owners would like the extra gate revenue the baseball would like having these games on tv it seems like a win-win for a lot of people the players might not want to play the extra couple of games that's why i only made it two games as opposed to you know six or whatever because what are they actually going to win for our franchises those players will not be there when the pick makes it to the majors. So do they care? I don't know. But it'd be interesting. I think so. I th I, I, I dig that part. Yeah. How, how about you, Kevin? I like anything innovative, and that seems like an innovative idea. So just to make sure I get this straight. So say there is 10-team playoff. Those mm -hmm. 10 teams make the traditional playoffs. And then mm -hmm. the teams with records 11 through 14 would play – in this NIT style tournament. So the, the four teams that just missed the mark mm -hmm. of making the traditional playoffs. Yes. I was, okay. I was personally doing it where only six teams made the playoffs. Uh, okay. Or I mean six and eight, so, so that you could still keep it the way that it is, but then just expand it slightly. So you still get playoff teams but they're not going for the World Series. So you're not diluting the World Series Ooh, uh, like you know, pool, this. but mm. you are still getting people to try and make it. And hey, maybe you make the World Series, maybe you get the number one pick. So that is kind of where I was going with that. Okay. So that so, was my so, way to reverse the dilution as well. So then in this year, it would have been the Jays, the, the Jays, Mariners. Yes. The, the A's. The Reds and the A's. I, I mean, that's... I, I would have I would have watched that. I would have yeah. watched that. That would have been great. It would have been interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the team that the teams that don't win. So you mm -hmm. have the team that wins that tournament, they get the number yeah. 1 overall pick. What picks do those other teams get? Or do they just so fall into the, their slot? The two teams of... that the two teams that win would go for 1 and 2. Whoever wins gets the number 1 pick, whoever loses gets the number 2. The other two teams would play for 3 and 4, basically. Whoever okay. wins that game gets 3. Yeah. And then the rest of the draft order would just be based on worst record. So the team with the worst record would theoretically have the fifth pick in the draft. I could go either way on that. It could be, you know, a uh, reverse order from the, not the, the team that just made the playoffs could have the number five pick. I don't care. Make it so that you're competing to get these picks is kind of the thought process. And then yeah, the teams I that are worse get the number 30 pick. Screw it. Yeah, Why not? Because it's a crapshoot I mean, anyway. What does it matter? <laughs> Yeah, on, honestly, I, I think just by giving them less than the the top five, I think the, that that would hit the that would take that message home. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I like this. We, we are we're very alike in our baseball thoughts, our baseball world, but this is something clear that that me and and Kevin do draw a line. I I really would rather not have expanded playoffs. Kevin says. Bring them all yeah. in. Let's have some fun. <laughs> I, not bring everybody in, but I would not be opposed to a 14-team playoff. If you're playing 162 games, I want to make those last month, month and a half worth something there. And I, I like think it. we should reward some of those fans. Th those teams that are kind of – and we interviewed Kevin Goldstein, and he talked about it, where you know a team looking into the season or they look at the offseason and say, ah, we're about a 83-84 uh, win team. What, let's, what are we doing? We know we're not going to make the playoffs. But if you have expanded playoffs to 14, 16 teams, something around that benchmark, then they can say, oh, maybe we will sign that one big free agent. And or that will get us over the hump to 87, 88 wins. Yeah. Even like a 
utility guy, like for the A's, like a Chad Pinder. Maybe he, instead of getting like a one-year $2 million deal, maybe he gets a one-year $4 or $5 million mm -hmm. deal. You could see those marginal players getting slightly better contracts because they could literally be the difference between getting yeah. the number one pick and not. And uh, I, I like that aspect of it as I, well. There's a lot of different facets, and I think it could work, maybe. Yeah, I, don't I, know. I, I think expanded playoffs is pro player in a way in the sense of those mid-tier free agents might actually get an opportunity because they mm -hmm. want teams would want that winning player, that, that player who uh, accumulates a one-and-a-half, two-war, that previously it's like, if you're the 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 super elite uh, elite team, you may not have a role for them. If you're a team that's tanking, it's like, well, why do we really need to sign this guy in the first place? But if you're a team that is kind of on the borderline of trying to make the playoffs, maybe go after that player. And also with expanded playoffs, that'd be more revenue for those players that make the playoffs. The right. the the payout, which is probably why players would be on board with your NIT style tournament idea. Of mm -hmm. I would assume if there's additional gate revenue and uh, additional. Uh, mm -hmm nationally televised games that some of that money is going to go into the pockets of the players on those four teams that are involved with that. And so. I also think that uh, there would be a lot more fans that would be intrigued. Like if their team won this two game mm -hmm. tournament, they would be more intrigued by who their team was going to draft yes. in the in the draft. And nobody talks about the draft. Nobody cares about yes. the draft. I, I barely pay attention to the draft and I do this <laughs> on a daily basis. So I think that that would also help the draft get more clout. So it, there's so many ways that it works, I think. Yeah. Uh, hopefully I explained it well and people can follow the thought process. But uh, I feel like it addressed a bunch of things. You know, it's just like, just this. That's yes, all. no, I, I, I love this. I'm actually going to be a proponent on this. We, we should actually yes. talk to Evan Klosky about this idea uh, be, when we have him on because I think that's a, a really interesting um, way of the, the tanking. I mean, honestly, you got to stop the tanking. It's disgusting what the, the Detroit Tigers has, have, have done in the last they, half decade to the, to the, to the Orioles. Like three number one picks. They had like five top five picks or something like that in the last five years. I'm like, oh, they're good now. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued to see what the Tigers do yeah. now. Yeah. But, and who uh, knows? May, and maybe if you had expanded playoffs a little bit, maybe the A's, who knows, with their owner, but maybe yeah. they would say, okay, we'll, we'll ride this thing out another year. I know we haven't yeah. had a lot of success in the playoffs, but you never know. You sneak in as a wild card or whatever it may be. There's always a chance there. So yeah. um, I'm actually going to text uh, Rob Manfred after the show and propose <laughs> the idea. And okay. we'll call it the – We'll have to slap Jason Burke's name on it. it you you give him some some kudos and credit. Yeah. Uh, one last thing here. Uh, we can't let you go without doing a little Hall of Fame discussion. Uh, I know you're not super, super passionate about the Hall of Fame and, and filling out a ballot and so forth. But give us your best, your best Hall of Fame, baseball Hall of Fame hot take. I want to hear it. We want to hear it. Oh man, I uh, I do not care about it much. That's um, a hot take. Where is that yeah. coming from? Where, where does that where, where does that I don't care come from? There's a lot of players that uh, you know I've enjoyed watching with the A's who are not even close on the Hall of Fame ballot. So I didn't grow up with a lot of the guys that are usually in the running. Uh, Barry Bonds always seemed like a jerk. Was he good at baseball? Yeah. Did he use steroids? Probably. Um, yeah, so I'm like, yeah, if he makes it, cool. If he doesn't, whatever, it's fine. I, Sure, whatever. Uh, people have their opinions. I don't care about their opinions. I I just don't care. It, there's just so much fighting that goes on surrounding the Hall of Fame debates. And I just avoid confrontation as most of it. <laughs> um, and that uh, Kurt Schilling, no. that That's a no. Um, just as a person. And, uh, you know, he was fine. I guess it's fine. Uh, put Todd Helton in. That's that's who I want. I want Todd Helton and like Billy Wagner. That's my Hall of Fame. There's oh other my guys gosh. too. We we did our Hall of Fame thing for Locked On. It has not been released. Uh, I picked a bunch of guys. I feel like I feel like I put Barry Bonds on, but if he doesn't, whatever. I don't care. Uh, I definitely voted for Tim Hudson though, because that guy was great. Tim Hudson was amazing. <laughs> You, so, you vote for Tim Hudson, but not Kurt Schilling. Got this it. Is, this is un yeah. unbelievable, Jason. <laughs> uh, that was a hot boom. take. Yeah, that was a hot put take. Me, put me in the in the Baseball Writers Association, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, God. Because I, well, I don't have to take it seriously. I, my opinion doesn't matter on this. I don't care. So you know, that's why I'm like, oh, I'll just have what, whoever I want. I don't, it, I don't need to make a case for anybody. 
honestly, uh, Kevin has had. I, I got We got to monetize this, Kevin. But he calls anti-social media. It's really anti-social media. There's just so much fighting because you 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 look at the votes, you look at the numbers. These guys were all really really good, but the fighting on on the anti-social media. Yeah, that that's when you got to you know kind of yeah. shut off that that mobile phone. Yeah. Um, Ulysses and I have not. Have we, we've yet to do our Hall of Fame episode where we would fill out our ballot, but that should be fun. I got to say that uh, my ballot would be very different than Jason Burke. I think I would too. say that. Hey, I have Schilling If you, guys need, here if on you my need an list. expert, I got this. I, I will be yeah. there. <laughs> You'll grade ours. When we do our, our, yeah. our, our Ooh, Hall of Fame ballot yeah. episode, we'll send them your way. How about that? Uh, this is great. Should, I, should I run through mine real quick? I know, we don't want to talk about it. I don't have mine. Sorry. Can I? I'll, I'll just throw. I'll, I'll let. I'll let Jason. You don't have to comment on this, but just here's the ten names. Okay. That I would vote for if I had a vote, which I don't have a vote, and I'll never have a vote. Quite frankly, I'm pretty sure of that. I'm pretty <laughs> confident of that. Schilling, Bonds, Clemens, Roland, Viscale, Wagner, Sosa, Abreu, Helton, and Joe Nathan. That is my 2022. Is that ten? Viscale also sucked. Um, <laughs> as a person, sure, but I'm not, I, I throw the person out. I, what they did on the field, the numbers. Yeah. Well, no, no, for, for me, um, I think that defensively great, did he do enough offensively? And I think that that's kind of where I'm like, ah, I don't know. Um, and that's, and for, you know, I know Ortiz was really, really good, but I'd have to look at his numbers and see if he legitimately, I know that he's great. Oh, he's a hall of I famer. I'm just not great. voting for him this year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, like, uh, and that's no, why I'm not voting for a rod this year either. I'm wait. Here's what I do with the steroid guys yes. and not to get into a whole thing, but I'm, I'm <laughs> playing the waiting game with them until they get to their 10th year. The ones that have, we know you did it. Okay. But you are still a great player. You're going to have to wait it out the 10 years, which is why I voted for bonds, Clemens and Sosa in this iteration. And then I know oh, Schilling Sosa. wanted to be taken off of it, but his <laughs> Schilling Crap person, but the numbers and the accolades, they, they speak for themselves, in my opinion. Uh, so I will give him that vote, but it is what it is. So uh, Ulysses, it sounds like we're, our Hall of Fame episode is going to be very fun. It's going to be very lively. <laughs> I didn't even know that we were going to get into this. Uh, th this is going to be fun. I can't wait until we have that episode, and I will send that link yes. over to Jason on our DMs and, and for him to enjoy. Uh, very excited. Last thing, Jason. Yes. Actually, maybe I should get Ulysses' take on this first. We do a little game. Name okay. that war. Oh, my gosh. Ooh. Do you have a, min okay. a name that war? I do. Okay, well, explain the game. Let's explain the okay. game. Okay. So, name that war is where I will bring up a player or Ulysses will bring up a player, and then we have to guess what this player's career war is. Okay. According to baseball reference. According to baseball reference. Ooh, Okay. So I am going to give you, and, and that's why I was going to have Ulysses answer okay. first before Jason, because Jason might know this, uh, considering he uh, does do a podcast on the Oakland Athletics. Mark Kotze. What is Mark Ooh. Kotze's career war? Okay. Um, okay, okay, okay. I don't even know, so I'm going to look this up right now. I'm going I'm I'm to do some math. Uh, Kotze, he was... Let's say like a. Fifth. Oh wow, you're doing math. I was just I picked a number out of the sky, and I'm like, that sounds about right. Wow, good. Okay. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I, I gotta go through the process. Okay, 15 years. He was probably like had like four years of being a good player. So three war. <laughs> so four times three is like next manager in the Oakland A's. <laughs> <laughs> four times three is twelve, and then I'm gonna go with. 10 years of being like a one war player. So that's 22 knock off a couple for defense, 22, 20. I'm going to go with 20. Okay. Jason, did he play 15 years? I don't know. That's what I'm guessing. I don't know either. I, I have, okay. I'm actually, we do this a little differently where normally I would know the answer ahead of time, but I don't even know it. So I'm going to okay. give my guess, too, after you give yours, Jason. So I don't think that he actually played that long. I don't. Th he might have. I don't know. Okay. Uh, need to look up my new manager. I was going to say 13.2. Okay. So okay. that okay. was 20? my that was my number out of out of the out of the air. 20 and 13.2. What do you got? Kevin this Weiss? is probably high. I know it's high, but 
I'm a fan of Michael Jordan. I'm going with 23. Okay. Uh, let's see what Put it is. Put him in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Mark Kotze, his career war, 21.3. Stupid math. Let's go, guys. <laughs> let's go. Wow. 20 to 21.3. That's good. That's pretty close. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm more excited about played. the manager now. Yeah, there we go. He yeah, played – 17 years from 97 to 2013. Wow. That's way longer than I thought. And I thought it was like squeaking by by 15. Yeah. 17. I thought that he wow. retired in like 2008. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, you, this okay, is what you're going to get from much... Marcotte every year 18 home runs and 270 batting average, basically. There you go. So, what was Kevin Cash's career war? Oh, like negative three. Yeah, Ooh, like negative oh, wow. One so yeah. he is i don't i can't do that matt do the math real quick what how much better is mark Kotze? 24 war better <laughs> <laughs> he's 24 well, no, no, better than but, Kevin like, but, but like times because how do you figure that out oh my gosh you're making me do math in line yeah line he's like a hundred times That's better it. but not well, that <laughs> whoops guys we've run out of time yeah will you look at that <laughs> The time is up. <laughs> Let's just say that Mark Kotze had a much better career, or I should say offensive career, than uh, Kevin Cash did. Well, if way. that's any indication on how Mark Kotze is going to be a manager, then I think good things are, are coming to Oakland. And honestly, Jason, always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, it was even better to have uh, Kevin, quote, Kyle Tucker, mm -hmm. uh, on, on the show <laughs> with us today. And uh, look, the best of, of luck with the stadium issue because I really do think if the A's can figure it out in Oakland, then you guys can give us a little bit of good vibes so that we can also have some good race baseball in, in Hillsborough County and Ivor city as we all want to, to have that without the split city yeah. situation. Yeah. And you guys also had the, the renderings that were released a couple of years ago. Was that yeah. right? And yeah. we've done that too. You guys are just a couple of years behind you. Just a couple more years. Just <laughs> keep going. <laughs> we'll be watching what you Almost guys do there. and then copy. Yeah. yeah. Copy paste. There we're we just go. With a uh, dome. <laughs> Jason, last thing. Is there anything you want to promote uh, on the podcast? Uh, I'm having a – oh, my wife's having a baby next week, so that's going to be fun. Hey! So, uh, hey! Yeah. Pr promote the hell out of that kid. Uh, <laughs> you will not be seeing him on social media because we are not putting his face there. Mm. Um, nice. It just seems weird. Um, but, yeah, that's all. Uh, I'll be on hiatus for a couple of weeks. Uh, Sully from Lockdown MLB is going to record some episodes, and I also probably have some in the bank. So well, there'll be some pre-recorded, but, you know, still very timely and very – great episodes for uh locked on a's listeners so go out go check that out we're available wherever the guys that locked on a raise are available um yeah it's fantastic at locked on a's on twitter and instagram i'm at by jason b on twitter and uh we're also on youtube just like these guys subscribe to that channel yeah you got a lot of subscribers from what i understand yeah. doing very well oh, very nice. so many so many more than us more than us baby <laughs> we're, we're, we're we're latching on to oakland yeah there you go yeah, Ooh, got a good fan base over here there you go. Split city between uh, Tampa and Oakland. Let's make it happen. Ooh, Let's do it. Combine the teams. That Oh, yeah. man, that would be a super team. Have uh, neutral site games in Vegas. There you go. We're, we're oh. Montreal and, and Vegas, gross. End the show. Yeah. Wrap it up. All right. That'll do it. Thank you again, Jason. Great time as always. Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs>